in the last lecture we were discussing about uh, various non idealities in a mos capacitor system uh, we did talk about uh, work function difference fixed oxide charge and interface trap density and how it impacts uh, you know the capacitance voltage characteristics um, you know today we will uh, continue that discussion and look at some more non idealities and uh, after that we will look at parameter extraction from a capacitance voltage uh, characteristics so just to sort of recap uh, what we have uh, said earlier if you have a p type substrate then the capacitance versus uh, voltage curve for an ideal situation will look like this and if it is only fixed oxide charge this will essentially shift to the left because fixed oxide charge is invariably positive and on the other hand if it is due to combination of both fixed oxide charge and interface trap not only will there be a shift but also there will be a stretch out and that is what we said the cv could probably get stretched out something like this right and this could be in the presence of both uh, fixed oxide charge and interface trap density depending on how much is the interface trap density and how much is the fixed oxide charge now typically today if you are looking at the silicon technology uh, silicon cmos technology we have figured out uh, ways to really minimize both fixed oxide charge and interface trap density today routinely we get uh, you know the fixed oxide charge in the range of less than you know 10 power 10 per centimeter square okay this is number if you want to actually get the charge you multiply with q that gives you the charge okay and similarly the dit that is interface trap density could also be of the order of 10 power 10 per centimeter square you know this is the kind of uh, uh, technology that we have you know but in the olden days in the early days of silicon uh, technology in this used to be very high in the range of 10 power 11 10 power 12 per centimeter square kind of numbers right they, those were very high numbers but we have come up with various process techniques to overcome uh, all these uh, issues okay uh, so and one other thing that uh, of, of course if you start looking at some other dielectric not silicon oxide on silicon if you are developing a new dielectric uh, then of course you could start with very high trap density then you need to optimize the process to minimize those trap density similarly today we are talking of building transistors on different substrate like germanium or you know compound semiconductors even there when you put an insulator on top of such a semiconductor your trap density may not be 10 power 10 you know your trap density not surprisingly will be in the range of 10 power 11 10 power 12 kind of numbers but then you need to optimize it and bring it down to these numbers if it has to compete with the kind of technology that silicon has today okay now in the context of fixed traps and interface traps there is one other uh, kind of uh, non idealities which is what is called uh, slow interface traps okay now just quickly look at uh, this typically in a silicon oxide system you will not see this slow interface traps okay what it means is that uh, you know it is not quite interface trap but it is not also fixed charge it does vary but it varies slowly okay now what is the implication of that you know the slow interface traps could lead to what is known as hysteresis in cv characteristics Now, when I say slow I need to sort of qualify that statement okay when I talk of interface traps I did tell you that interface traps do respond to the slow wearing I mean that signal that is applied to the gate if it is slow wearing that is because they have certain time constants to interact with the channel charge so that they can exchange charge okay. Typically the interface charge uh, traps that we have they have time constants you know anywhere from you know microsecond to millisecond you know maybe a few tens of millisecond okay and that is why we call them you know they are fairly fast you know but if you have uh, on the other hand if you talk of uh, fixed charge it has time constant which is sort of infinite meaning it does not really change right once it is positive it just stays positive it does not get uh, discharged and become neutral you see that is another extreme but if your oxide that you have put in has you know some extra defects 
there may not be exactly at the interface may be little away from the interface hence the time constant is little slower okay then you know you may have what are called slow traps and which may have their time constants in a few seconds okay a few seconds hmm. now what is the implication of this right typically whenever you do a cv characteristic right that is capacitance versus voltage characteristics you can sweep the gate voltage either from negative voltage to positive voltage or from positive voltage to the negative voltage and you can do both in which it is called a bidirectional cv characteristics right i have swept the voltage from negative to positive and come back from positive to negative okay so ideally you know if you do this in the forward direction if your cv looks like this in the reverse direction the cv will essentially overlap on top of it this is what you will have ideally okay indeed this is what you will have in most of the silicon devices today you will never see any hysteresis that is forward and reverse cv are identical okay now this will happen if you have fixed charge even if you have interface state traps you know they will not really fast interface traps that is they will not really give in rise to any hysteresis okay because you know they are responding you know typically the cv measurement time frames are few seconds right maybe uh, you know you go back here from minus 5 volt to plus 5 volt let's say you know that may take a few second and then you start coming back okay that is how your cv characteristic would uh, look okay now what happens with the slow interface traps is that they do not respond during the cv sweep because that sweep is reasonably fast for them okay but once you are here you know you are essentially spending time once you reach this band bending the band bending doesn't change in inversion it's more or less constant and similarly the band bending in accumulation is also more or less constant okay now you know going up the days coming back like this will be a time matter of a few seconds during this time they would respond meaning only at this extreme and at this extreme they will respond okay because they are relatively slow they do not respond during the cv sweep okay so what i mean by that again recall our discussion at this point our band bending will look something like this this is fermi level okay accumulation condition at this time the band bending will look like this inversion condition remember okay and you know here ideally you know all these traps should be empty and all these traps should be filled correct because below this uh, fermi level that is what we are looking at okay but what happens with respect to these uh, so called uh, slow traps they may not be exactly at the interface but they may be little bit away from this interface let's say somewhere here and hence they take little longer time to respond uh, they also respond to the level of fermi level position that you have okay so what happens is that let's say out here you have all the traps empty okay and when you come here you fill all these traps right with the electrons okay and now when you're going back you have those extra charges in these traps okay and these extra charges stay put when you're doing this cv sweep right so because you have these extra traps extra charge in this case when i have come from negative to positive i have this condition and when i'm waiting here during this period and while i'm coming back all these are now filled with electrons okay now you see when i'm going back i have extra negative charge here and because there is an extra negative charge the cv will not trace the original cv the cv will actually go back like this why go back like this because there is an extra negative charge whenever there is an extra negative charge the curve shifts to the right okay if there is extra positive charge the curve shifts to the left okay so it goes back like this in other words forward sweep will be like this a reverse sweep will be like this and hence there is what is called a hysteresis okay and whenever there are slow interface traps the hysteresis is always counterclockwise 
notice here while you were coming here the CV was like this and at this extreme you fill lot of electrons here and the charge is you know negative and hence it went in here and here you have lot of positive charge the CV will come here and so on and so forth. So, whenever first of all if you see a hysteresis in CV characteristic that is indicative of the fact that there are so called slow interface traps which is also not good just as fast interface traps are not good even slow interface traps are not good and if the hysteresis is counterclockwise that is clearly a signature of the hysteresis is coming due to slow interface traits. Okay. And you know it turns out you could also have hysteresis eh, which we rarely have unless you know today we take lot of care in making sure that there are no uh, impurities in terms of uh, so called mobile ions such as sodium, potassium and so on and so forth. Right? If you have mobile ions then you can also have a hysteresis which is called clockwise hysteresis. Hysteresis will not be a counterclockwise hysteresis, a hysteresis will be a clockwise hysteresis. So, clockwise hysteresis is not an indication of slow interface traps. Okay? Whereas, if you have slow interface traps there is going to be a hysteresis and that is always going to be counterclockwise as we discussed. Okay? Now, at this point it may be worthwhile to also discuss the non idealities of mobile ion charge which as I said is very rare, but again if you mess up with your cleaning procedure and instead of taking quartz where you take a pyrex glass to clean your uh, device silicon pyrex is a very good contaminant of sodium and potassium. Right? When we talk of mobile ion charge in oxide we are essentially talking of sodium, potassium and so on and so forth okay? which are uh, you know metal impurities you know positively charged metal impurities. Okay? If you have this then you will always have again a hysteresis and that will be a clockwise hysteresis. It also becomes clear why that is the case. First of all when we say mobile ion charge what it means is that I have this uh, MOS capacitor there is an oxide here. Okay? This is our SiO2. Now this oxide is contaminated with this mobile ion. So, these mobile ions can either move to this interface or move to this interface depending on your voltage on the gate electrode. When I have negative gate electro voltage all these charges will move away from the silicon interface to this interface. Remember what we said last time the charges which are closest to the interface have the maximum effect on CV. In fact, if the charges are out here they have absolutely no effect on CV characteristics. Okay. On the other hand if I have a positive voltage then all these charges will be repelled because of the positive gate voltage and they will all move to this interface. But again this movement you see takes time it will not respond instantaneously and that time is also in the order of a few seconds. So, now just imagine what will happen because of this right I have this gate voltage and this capacitance curve let us say I started with negative gate voltage and negative voltage all these charges are here. So, there is no effect felt because of the charge and the CV will look very good like this. Now, there is a positive gate voltage and because positive gate voltage will stay there for a certain amount of time all these charges by this time will drift towards this and will accumulate here. So, when I am doing my reverse CV by this time all these charges would have come here. Now, we have all this positive charge. So, whenever there is a positive charge the CV will go towards the left remember that right. We have discussed all this in the last class. So, when I am doing the reverse CV the reverse CV will go like this. Again I go here for some time all these charges will go back now to this electrode. So, when I am doing the forward CV see we will again come back here because now it does not feel this positive charge all the positive charge are repelled all the way to the gate electrode okay? and hence its effect is not at all felt. So, when you have this mobile ion charge the hysteresis as you see is clockwise this is what I meant clockwise hysteresis whereas, here the hysteresis is counterclockwise you know the hysteresis look like looks like this you know there is a counterclockwise sense for this hysteresis. Okay? So, as I said you know if you 
have really these mobile ion charges for whatever reason you may see a clockwise hysteresis and if you have these slow traps because you are doing different dielectrics on silicon or new substrate again you may have slow traps that will give you counterclockwise hysteresis. Ideally we should not have any hysteresis you know forward and reverse should be exactly on top of each other that would be the ideal condition ok. You could have fixed charge fast interface traps, but slow interface traps should not be present hmm? and that is where you would uh, essentially need to optimize your process and you know make sure that your slow interface traps are uh, you know eliminated from the system. There are two more rather three more non idealities that I wanted to discuss uh, you know the next uh, important thing is what is called uh, uh, this uh, charge quantization effect. Okay. And more precisely also referred to as channel charge quantization uh, the charge that you have and it is especially problematic when you are in inversion condition okay. and let us just look at what it is right. So, this is p type silicon again let us say I have positive gate voltage V g and this is S i O 2 uh, when I apply let us say plus 5 volt. I have inverted this and you have lot of electrons here ok. This is what we call channel charge ok. Now, if you look at in this direction if you look at the band bending in that direction ok what you will essentially have is the following right. This is your oxide you applied a positive voltage to the oxide ok and let us say this is your Fermi level here and there is a band bending which would look like this ok silicon band has bent and that is why it is p type here and it is n type here ok I have reached inversion condition. Hmm. Now, where are these electrons all these electrons are supposed to be very close to this interface you see this is oxide as you know SiO2 this is silicon and I have applied a positive gate voltage and hence that positive gate voltage corresponds to this distance that you have you know separation of these two Fermi levels is essentially the applied voltage correct. Now, what happens in modern day device all the nanometric device right they have extremely thin oxide first of all remember and thin oxide has increased the electric fields right. Electric field is essentially dependent on voltage divided by thickness of oxide as you know we have not really followed constant electric field scaling theory. So, fields have increased that is one aspect oxide field has increased and oxide field is related to silicon field also right and the silicon field not only depends on the oxide thickness, but also depends on the doping concentration. If you have a high doping concentration the depletion width is small and you are dropping that voltage whatever silicon voltage over a very narrow distance and that exacerbates this and hence the fields will be large in silicon. And if fields are large remember we have discussed this electric field is gradient of band bending correct. We have uh, 1 over q d by d x correct that is this band bending that we have how fast is this band bending or the gradient of this band is directly proportional to electric field. If we have higher and higher electric field these bands bend more and more sharply something like this very sharp band bending indicating that fields are very large. Now, something interesting happens and that is the electrons which are here they almost looks like a particle in a box right. In other words you know what we mean by particle in a box is that if we have a potential well and if you put electrons in a potential well this electron cannot take any arbitrary energy right the energy of this electron will be quantized ok. There are only certain modes that are allowed because the wave function of the electron should go to 0 at these points because there is a huge energy barrier electrons cannot really you know exist beyond this point based on the wave nature ok and that will quantize the energy electron can only take discrete energy it cannot take continuous energy ok. 
in other words what happens here this is almost like this not quite you know it is not like a rectangular potential well, but nonetheless it looks like a potential well and hence the energies of the electrons will be quantized and what it means is that the number of states available uh, that goes down and hence the number of carriers will also go down. Right? We, we remember the total number of carriers is probability of the occupancy which is governed by the Fermi Dirac statistics multiplied by the number of allowed energy states and what is happening because of this quantization earlier any energy allowed was allowed for the electrons. Now, there are only fixed energy levels that electron can take and hence this is a phenomenon that is called inversion charge quantization or channel charge quantization which reflects as if your threshold voltage of the transistor increases effectively mm, that is one aspect that is not the end of the story. There is also remember the semiconductor capacitance in inversion we said d q psi s by d psi s okay. and uh, of course, there was a negative sign here and we said in inversion the for a small change in potential there is a large change in electron concentration and hence when we had this equivalent combination of C ox in series with C silicon we said C silicon is infinity or very large compared to C ox okay. and hence the net capacitance becomes C ox in inversion right. But now that is no longer the case for two reasons C ox itself has gone up because C ox is epsilon ox by T ox because T ox went down C ox went up right that is one part of the story and C s will not be very large because the d q psi s by d psi s will not be large because there are only finite allowed energy states for a small change in the surface potential the electron charge will not change as rapidly as it would have earlier right and hence it degrades your inversion layer capacitance. Okay. That is if you were doing a CV measurement on a transistor right this is very important in the context of MOS transistor your high frequency or low frequency both remember I said will give you a curve which looks like this wherein this maximum capacitance is C ox. Okay. Now, in presence of channel quantization charge quantization your maximum capacitance in inversion will be degraded like this it will be less than C ox. Okay. It will be less than C ox because C ox is in series with C silicon C silicon is not infinity now it is finite capacitance and that will degrade the series combination okay. and effective capacitance will go down. Okay. So, this is a very very important uh, manifestation that happens in uh, most of the devices today. Okay. It could also happen in accumulation to some extent but in accumulation the, the band bending is not as much as it would happen in inversion okay. and you know the effect in accumulation is not as severe as one would uh, see in inversion. Maybe in accumulation there is a very small effect may not be as big an effect as you would see in inversion. Okay. So, this is the C V curve in a transistor uh, anyway if you are doing a CV curve on a capacitor you know capacitor will anyway show up like this, but inversion capacitance will anyway be not at C ox it will be much lower governed by the depletion bit maximum depletion bit, but accumulation capacitance may have some impact okay. it may sort of degrade a little bit. Okay. So, this is one other important consideration that uh, one has to people also model this effectively as if saying you know your effective oxide thickness has increased and hence your capacitance will degrade okay. and that is why when we do the oxide thickness extraction using C V characteristic we call this uh, oxide thickness as an electrical oxide thickness not a physical oxide thickness. Your electrical oxide thickness extracted from C V curve may not be exactly equal to your elect, uh, you know physical oxide thickness and this could be one of the reason why your electrical oxide thickness will be little different from physical oxide thickness. What I mean by electrical oxide thickness is that I take this capacitance value and I say okay, look this capacitance or accumulation capacitance is epsilon ox epsilon naught A by T ox. Okay. 
and I know what is my a, I know what is my epsilon ox and epsilon naught, I have measured my c and I will calculate my c ox. Okay. This kind of oxide thickness calculation is what is called electrical T ox hmm, as opposed to physical T ox. Hmm. Invariably in today's devices electrical oxide thickness could be anywhere from about 4 to 6 angstrom more than physical oxide thickness and one reason is this and the other reason is what we call a polysilicon depletion effect. Okay. So, that is one other non-ideality Okay, but this effect does not exist if you have a metal gate capacitor or a metal gate transistor. Hmm? Metal gate transistor this will not be there, this will be there only if your gate is polysilicon. Okay. Now, 45 nanometer and beyond mostly we are using metal gate transistor okay. that you know this is a mute point in that case okay. and the only thing that uh, you worry about is quant channel charge quantization which may affect your equivalent uh, electrical oxide thickness because you have ultra thin oxides. Okay. Polysilicon depletion is the case you know just for completeness let us also look at what it is you know you have p silicon and this oxide and this is polysilicon okay. and this polysilicon is supposed to be doped with if it is a n MOS kind of a transistor this will all be supposed to be n plus heavily doped n plus. Okay. But let us say for some reason it is not very heavily doped. Okay. If it is not very heavily doped it is more like n minus. Okay. If it is like n minus and let us say I have applied positive voltage what will happen if I apply positive voltage it is as if I am applying a reverse bias to this p n junction. Uh, this is at ground potential and this is at positive potential and that will create a depletion region here correct like a reverse bias p n junction you have a depletion width you know as you increase reverse bias your depletion width starts increasing okay and because of that this poly depletion under positive voltage not under negative voltage under positive voltage it adds a new capacitance in series earlier my model was only oxide capacitance in series with silicon capacitance but now i have what is called a c poly capacitance ideally that poly was supposed to be a metal like you know electrode but it is no longer because it will uh, 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 contribute add a capacitance here and hence again the total capacitance will degrade because of that because as soon as you start putting capacitances in series your total capacitance starts coming down. Okay. So, even under polysilicon depletion what you will see is again let us just look at the transistor structure this is accumulation in inversion ideally you should have had something like this correct. But as I start applying positive voltage higher and higher positive voltage more and more depletion effect. So, very interestingly your curve starts looking like this. Okay. It will never reach C ox, it will start degrading and I, when I start again this measurement is done on a transistor uh, not on a capacitor. If it is done on a capacitor anyway the minimum capacitor inversion is uh, C minimum you know that we will not worry about it right now. Okay. But in a transistor structure the capacitance in inversion should have been oxide capacitance correct but no longer the case because when I start putting positive here there is a poly depletion this depletion effect increases larger the depletion lower the capacitance and hence the series capacitance starts degrading because this capacitance is pulling everything down. Okay. So, this is also not desirable in fact one of the reason why we moved away from polysilicon gate to metal gate was precisely this I told you a couple of reasons one is the resistivity when I have this long finger poly finger you know that contributes uh, RC delay and hence I wanted to sort of that resistance is also because you are not able to dope it very well. Okay. In addition to that you also have this kind of a poly depletion and your on current of the transistor will suffer very dramatically because of that okay. because remember your on current of a transistor is directly proportional to your oxide capacitance in inversion for a transistor. 
if your oxide capacitance in inversion degrades like this in polydepletion or degrades like this in channel quantization that will degrade your on current of a transistor and that is why we say your threshold voltage has now increased because your on current has decreased accordingly. Okay. So, this is one other very important uh, non-ideality that uh, you know <coughs> uh, we want to keep in mind and again, again as I said in a metal gate transistor you know this is not an issue. right? So, the one last uh, you know non-ideality that I want to talk about is during the measurement this is all related to the device structure okay but during the measurement you may have what is called a series resistance effect or a parallel resistance or parallel conductance effect okay and sometimes we you know rather than calling it r parallel we call it g parallel <coughs> now what is it how do you do the cv measurement let us just take high frequency CV measurement right. It is very simple as I mentioned anyway you have a DC bias let us not worry about DC bias right now I apply some uh, uh, AC voltage which has some magnitude and an angle theta. Okay. Let us say this is my reference and I make this theta as 0 degree okay. I am just representing it in a phasor form and I have my device under test which we call DUT. Okay and what you do is measure this current and its angle right theta it is a phasor right. All you are doing is that you have this device under test you are applying some input excitation you are looking at what current is coming out okay. and then you say look my z is essentially v divided by i theta correct and all that equipment is doing is measuring this current phasor that is coming out at the output and it knows what voltage phasor it has applied and taking the impedance as V divided by I theta. Okay. This is the you know uh, impedance that you get which is essentially mod Z and angle phi let us say it has certain angle and it has certain magnitude. Now, if it is an ideal capacitance no issue right you know because the angle will be 90 degree and you know whatever magnitude you have you know it is capacitance you know it is uh, you know uh, 1 over j omega c is its impedance right you know the magnitude and you equipment has some routines it will spit out a capacitance value for you. But as a user you need to tell the equipment whether the device under test looks like a series RC combination because of non idealities this is your MOS capacitor that you are trying to measure device that you have built or it looks like you know G parallel and see whatever MOS capacitance that you have okay, that you have built. Okay. Meaning that it has to resolve this Z into either this form or into this form Z is same but when it is resolved into this form you get a different number for resistance and different number for capacitance. When you take the same z and resolve into this you get a different value of resistance and different value of capacitance. As I said if there was no non ideality then you get 0 resistance here and the exact same value of capacitance. The capacitance here if it is let us say 100 picofarad it you get 0 resistance if you resolve it like this you get infinite conductance here okay it's like an open circuit this branch is open circuit if it is an ideal capacitance and you get the same 100 picofarad here right this is only if there are no other external non idealities external or internal now you see when you're doing this there may be a series resistance because you have not probed it properly if you are not very careful there could be this cable that you are connecting to equipment and that may also have some resistance okay. and you know the metal that you have used may not be very good that may also contribute some series resistance. All these are sources of series resistance. What are the sources of parallel conductance? If you have ultra thin gate oxide, if you have ultra thin gate oxide then the gate oxide will also leak because of the direct tunneling current that we talked about. If you have a thick gate oxide there is absolutely no conduct no leakage through that 
but if you have an ultra thin gate oxide as I said let us say 1 nanometer gate oxide and you have built this MOS capacitor there is always a leakage here there is a DC path correct and this essentially is showing the DC path. Okay. So, as a user for example, if you have made sure that there are no series resistance invariably the rule of thumb is that if you are dealing with a MOS capacitor which has reasonably thick insulator which means let us say 10 20 nanometer and you have actually verified by doing an IV measurement that there is absolutely no leakage then you never use this model okay, because there is no uh, leakage path anyway. Huh? There is no leakage path meaning this model is true. So, at no point in time it allows a DC leakage current here whereas, this model allows you a DC leakage current to be modeled correct that is what we are saying the device under test has to be modeled properly. So, thick oxide use a series model always because no leakage. And you verify you can always verify you can do a very simple IV measurement on this MOS structure and make sure that there is no leakage current or even if there is a current let us say pico ampere or 10 pico ampere you have a terahertz I mean tera ohms kind of a uh, you know resistance which has almost like an open circuit. So, you do not worry about this, but there could be some series resistance you model it like that then you get the right value. On the other hand if you are dealing with let us say less than 1 nanometer kind of SiO2 or an high k dielectric which is very crappy you are developing a high k process ideally high k process if you have a 5 to 10 nanometer it should have 0 direct leakage current. But for some reason you know you really have large leakage which you can always verify by doing a simple DC IV measurement okay. then you better use this model because there is always a DC conduction path and what it means is that the current that you are measuring has a DC component also you tell the equipment that this is a more realistic model to use not this model right. If you do not follow this then you will actually get an incorrect result for your capacitance ok. In fact you know I will leave this as an exercise you can actually do it yourself that if you were to do this kind of an equivalence you see that when r is not 0 and this is not uh, infinity your capacitances in these two cases will not be equal right. For the same z you will get two different capacitance value okay. and that is when you have to decide okay, what is the value to choose and that depends on what additional information that you have on your device okay. and you need to be careful about uh, you know that uh, non uh, ideality. Okay. <coughs> And more specifically you know if I may uh, sort of elaborate it very quickly if you have let us say series resistance only let us say this is my ideal CV curve HF CV curve which I should have got ok right when your RS is equal to 0 and, uh, and accordingly your uh, R parallel is infinity ok. But if RS is not 0 Hmm? Then if you are doing the CV measurement the what will happen is that in the low uh, capacitance value range the effect will be not as great, but when the capacitance is very large you know you will actually see a degradation of the capacitance. That is if in reality now this is R s non 0 R s non 0. Okay, but you have told the equipment that R s non 0 meaning this is how the model should have been uh, this is your actual capacitance that you wanted to get, but by mistake you have told the equipment that use this model that either is effectively it looks like this uh, and there is a parallel resistance and my d u t is look this you extract this value from z if it extract this value your capacitance will be less than what it should have been, but if you use the right model then you know you will get back the same capacitance. Right? In fact when you do the measurement right of course if R s is 0 the ideal then there is no issue, but non-zero R s or 
conductance whenever you ask the equipment to do a series model and parallel model you see that the two series will be entirely different right and you make sure that you do the right mod uh, e representation for the device and you get the right capacitance right. So, that is the uh, important message that uh, I wanted to convey ok. okay so, let us look at now uh, this issue of uh, you know parameter extraction extraction from C V. Okay. <laughs> what I mean by parameter extraction is I want to extract what is my oxide thickness I let me call it electrical oxide thickness, what is my substrate doping, what is my fixed oxide charge, what is my D I T and so on and so forth right. These are the most important uh, uh, parameters that uh, you want to a very simple thing that you do is that you make a MOS capacitor, you do a high frequency CV and you should make sure that you get a true high frequency CV ok. The frequency should be reasonably large so that you know you get a capacitance which looks like this ok and make sure that I mean if, if there is hysteresis of course, that is due to slow interface traps you know that hysteresis will only tell you how much is the slow interface traps ok. Now, fine. So, what you do first is that you look at this value accumulation capacitance and you say that this accumulation capacitance is essentially due to oxide capacitance ok <coughs> and you say that you know it this is epsilon naught you know the area of the capacitance that you have built and T ox electrical ok T ox electrical extracted in accumulation region right. So, you know this you know this and hence you could extract your oxide uh, thickness ok. Once you have the oxide thickness right then you can go back to this minimum capacitance C minimum ok. Remember that C minimum is essentially determined by the doping concentration ok. It, it has a strong influence I mean doping concentration has a strong influence on minimum capacitance right. So, first of all what you have to do is that from this measured C minimum you need to get what is the silicon C minimum because this measured C minimum is really silicon C minimum in series with oxide capacitance you see in, in other words whenever you are doing the measurement what you measure is really always oxide capacitance in series with silicon capacitance correct. So, you need to first get the silicon capacitance from this you know this already you know this already because this is oxide capacitance you can always get uh, the minimum silicon capacitance ok. Now, you also know the area once you get minimum silicon capacitance you remember always we deal with per unit area capacitances when we do calculations right. So, you know divide it by area and you get the per unit area capacitance right which let me call C s min prime which is essentially this divided by area and that is essentially epsilon silicon epsilon naught divided by W max where W max is a maximum depletion width correct. So, now you know this and this is known anyway and you can extract what is maximum depletion width. Once you know the maximum depletion width you can find out doping concentration now because as you may recall the maximum depletion width essentially is given by right when you reach a band bending of 2 phi b that is when I reach inversion correct divided by q n a where n a is the doping concentration that I want to find out. However, phi b is also dependent on doping concentration because phi b is k t over q l n n a over n i, but you can solve this equation iteratively and because you know this you can extract n a value right and hence you find out what is n a value hmm. and this uh, we are doing assuming that the doping concentration is uniform. If it is not uniform doping concentration then also there is a way to extract doping concentration as a function of depth by looking at the C V characteristics right. So, you know uh, the, the textbooks will certainly discuss that you know this is a little more involved, but one can easily do that. 
but for most of the calculation a uh, uniform doping concentration is a reasonably good estimate right especially when one is doing process uh, development anyway one starts with a you know standard silicon wafer which has anyway uniform doping concentration you do not do any implantation or diffusion which will alter the doping concentration as a function of depth ok. So, uniform doping concentration is a reasonably good uh, estimate ok. As soon as you get this doping concentration I can extract what is flat band capacitance. First of all flat band capacitance in silicon because flat band capacitance in silicon as you know is epsilon silicon epsilon naught by Debye length lambda L d or sometimes this is also referred to as lambda d Debye length. And remember I told you what Debye length is in the last lecture that is essentially related to uh, your uh, uh, doping concentration ok. Hmm? So, once you know N a this is thermal voltage instead of uh, band bending psi s psi s is 0 anyway we have thermal voltage here and N a is what is already evaluated and I can find out this and everything else is known anyway you multiply this with area you get flat band capacitance of silicon. Then you can ask the question ok if this is a flat band capacitance of silicon because it is coming in series with oxide capacitance what would be the measured flat band capacitance and that is simply C f b measured is 1 over I mean C ox in series with silicon flat band capacitance correct. And that will give you what is the flat band capacitance that would be measured flat band capacitance. What it means is that in this C v curve now I am locating a very unique point which is a flat band capacitance point. And this in this point on the C V curve gives you flat band voltage and that is how you obtain a flat band voltage ok. Once you know the flat band voltage you know the flat band voltage as you know is phi m s minus q f by C ox correct. Phi m s presumably you know because you know phi s because you have obtained doping concentration in silicon it is easy to find out phi s now. Phi m presumably you know what metal you have put on the gate and you can take the metal work function as phi m. Phi m s is known, V f b is known already from the graph and I can ca calculate what is q f correct. So, q f can be easily computed using this ok. So, now I have done T ox, I have done uh, N a, I have done q f. The next important thing is to measure d i t you know which is one of the most important uh, thing especially if you want to get a very good quality m o s capacitor. So, how do we get this d i t there are multiple ways one can uh, get this d i t ok. So, let us look at uh, you know different ways of uh, getting d i t. The first thing that you can do is that you can look at uh, only high frequency C V from high frequency C V you can get d i t uh, you do not need to do low frequency C V ok. Remember our model that we have I apply a gate voltage on the gate terminal this is oxide capacitance this is my channel and the, the, that is the psi s surface potential this is the surface potential which is changing depending on the applied gate bias and your silicon capacitance plus interface trap capacitance. At high frequency it is 1 over C ox plus 1 over C s because when I am doing a high frequency measurement C i t does not respond. Although the stretch out is there the value of the capacitance will not increase ok this is what we have discussed in the last lecture. On the other hand in the low frequency you know it is C s plus C i t which comes in series with C ox. So, in a high frequency C V measurement just looking at this I do not have the d i t information. However, remember the stretch out of the high frequency characteristic gives me d i t information. So, what I need to find out is what is that stretch out ok. So, how do you do that ok. 
okay. So, let us look at this right you know your oxide voltage can be written as V g minus psi s right and that is what it is V g V ox is equal to V g minus psi s okay. psi s is a silicon potential. Now, there are two elements in series total voltage is V g subtract the silicon potential you get the oxide potential. Also Q g the charge that is put okay, at any gate bias remember the stretch out that we are talking about at any gate bias when I go from one gate bias to the next gate bias I give enough time and hence there is a stretch out. So, the gate charge that is put is now Q s and Q i t combined. Okay. Q s is a silicon charge which is essentially coming due to the impurities ionized impurities and electrons and Q i t is a interface trap charge. And now uh, hence I can write V ox is C ox times Q g is essentially C ox times V g minus phi s okay. and this essentially is Q s and Q i t and what I am doing here is that you differentiate this equation with respect to psi s okay. and if you do that C ox d V g over d psi s minus 1 because d psi s by d psi s is 1 minus d q psi s by d phi s and d q i t by d psi s and what is this? This is C s plus C i t. Okay. So, C ox is d V g by d phi s minus 1 equal to C s plus C i t and hence C i t is C ox times d V g over d psi s minus 1 minus C s. Okay. This we can rewrite it as because V g is an independent variable I am controlling V g from the external world and psi s is a dependent variable psi s is responding to the change in gate voltage and hence I am rewriting d V g by d psi s as d psi s by d V g inverse right that is all I have done here it is the same thing rewritten here. Okay. So, C i t is C ox times this quantity times C s. Now, you see I have a means to figure out d i t if I do high frequency measurement from high frequency measurement at every psi s each psi s uniquely defines C s remember that because psi s is the band bending as soon as you fix the band bending there is a particular value of C s that is it because that band bending will fix Q s in silicon and that Q s will correspond to certain C s value. So, at any psi s I know C s and if I, I have already computed C ox because C ox is measured anyway that is known to me if we can find out what is d psi s by d v g at every value of psi s then I can put that value here and C s value here and get C i t. If I get C i t remember C i t is q d i t and hence I get d i t value at that psi s and hence I can generate d i t versus psi s plot. Okay. At different band bending I can get d i t in other words I am getting interface traps in the band gap very nicely. So, how do you do that from the measured information? So, what you do is the following right I need to get this how do you get this and to get this we essentially <coughs> first we note that as I mentioned for any band bending psi s I can estimate what should be C s because there is a very unique mapping between psi s and C s and that is essentially based on solution of Poisson's equation. If you solve Poisson's equation you get Q s which is semiconductor charge as plus minus plus minus indicating that when it is in accumulation it is positive charge when it is in depletion on inversion it is negative charge. Okay. Accordingly psi s is positive or negative in accumulation it is negative in inversion it is positive. Okay. So, this e expression here this corresponds to all your charge corresponding to whole charge this you know whole charge and also the depletion charge and this expression corresponds to your minority carrier charge which is electron charge. I have already found out Na you see and I know uh, you know all other constants epsilon silicon everything. Now, for different values of psi s I can generate q s right I have given a doping concentration I have a very unique relation between q s and psi s. 
once you know the QS and psi s you can very easily get capacitance because capacitance remember is d q psi s c silicon capacitance by d psi s ok. So, all you need to do is that you generate psi s versus q s which is here and you differentiate this you know you can write a very simple program to do that it could be even a excel program to do that you put in several psi s value generate q s you do d q s by d psi s and you have a capacitance except if you want to get high frequency capacitance you ignore this term because this term is due to minority carriers. We say that under high frequency minority carriers do not respond and hence I ignore this term I only retain this term and I generate C H F versus psi s ok. In other words for different values of psi s psi s going from 0 which is flat band going towards 2 phi b which is going towards inversion I generate all the values of capacitances. So, this is theoretical right from theory I have been able to generate this, but this value of capacitance uniquely corresponds you know this is my measured C H F versus V G I have measured it, but this psi s uniquely corresponds to the same band bending because only when you have that band bending you will get this capacitance because it is C ox in series with C silicon and hence for every capacitance value you have a unique value of psi s and this unique value of psi s maps to a unique value of V g this is your measured curve. Okay. So, for every value of psi s again you know you can either do it graphically, but you do not want to do it manually again a very simple program can be written to do that every value of psi s will have a unique value of V g and in other words what you have generated is really psi s versus V g this psi s versus V g would be theoretical I do not really need to worry about theoretical psi s versus V g and I can also generate psi s versus V g theoretically ok forget about this curve. All I am trying to tell you is that by comparing this with the measured C V I have this psi s versus V g curve and because I have psi s versus d V g curve I can get d psi s by d V g very easily at any value of psi s I put a value of psi s I find out what is d psi s by d V g and I also find out what is c, c s because it is very uniquely defined for that value of psi s. As soon as I know both these quantities I know c s I put that value here I know d psi s by d V g I put that value here. I have anyway measured oxide thickness oxide capacitance I know what is C i t once you know C i t you know D i t. In other words what you have generated for every value of psi s you have generated D i t versus psi s plot ok and this D i t versus psi s plot gives you the interface depth density in the band gap of silicon ok and this is what is called uh, sometimes uh, this was first proposed by a person called Terman and in fact it is also called Terman's differentiation technique use this differentiation process of psi s versus V g d psi s versus d V g is used in estimating interface trap density. Okay. <coughs> so, this is one way of doing so just by having high frequency C V capacitance you can do this measurement especially when your trap density is very large this measurement is fairly accurate, but if you are trap density is very very low like 10 power 10 then this kind of a differentiation process leads to some errors ok. Then this process will not be very accurate, but for most of the process development when you are doing a new high k dielectric you know your trap density is reasonably large and you can very easily just do a CV measurement just high frequency CV and you can obtain the interface trap density as well using the C V measurement ok. There are two other ways of doing C interface trap measurement which we will discuss in the next lecture. Those two measurements will work only if you have a ideal I mean not ideal a good low frequency measurement done along with the high frequency measurement ok and that we will discuss uh, in the next lecture. So, just to sort of uh, wrap up you know there are multiple non idealities in a CV system 
which we discussed uh, ranging from fixed charge, interface charge, slow traps right and we need to deal with these uh, non-idealities. And also there are ways to extract the uh, various parameters from the CV measurements as we discussed today. So, uh, you know now if you have both high frequency and low frequency measurement you know then what one could do is that you know as I mentioned here I will go to this equation remember this ok. Then you know from this equation I should be able to uh, get the interface trap density here ok. So, you know how, how, how does one that uh, one do that right uh, now assuming that you have just the low frequency capacitance ok. Do not worry about this equation you know we will postpone the discussion on this uh, equation uh, for a minute ok ok maybe I was looking at the wrong slide yeah maybe let us just focus on this right. I have measured uh, low frequency CV measurement remember that in the depletion region the low frequency capacitance responded to interface states right. If your high frequency was lower your low frequency was higher it would be much higher because the slow varying signal traps can easily respond to that and that is why I have this model CS plus CIT and now CIT can be written as 1 over CLF minus 1 over COX minus CS ok. You have measured this low frequency capacitance and all you need to do now is that at different psi s you need to find out C s huh? and also need to find out a relationship between psi s and V g. Earlier we found that psi s versus V g relationship through that differentiation technique, but here we will not do that differentiation we will actually use an integration technique of a low frequency curve as opposed to differentiation technique of psi s v g derived out of a high frequency curve. Now, we are not looking at high frequency at all we are only looking at a low frequency curve. So, what do we do right and uh, this is a generic uh, expression that we have C ox times d v g by d psi s minus 1 is C s plus C i t ok which is what we derived earlier when we were discussing uh, the C v measurement. Now, you know one can sort of rewrite this equation a little bit you know just some algebraic manipulation right you know you sort of uh, uh, you know take this d phi s on this side and uh, you know you have d c ox d v g as d phi s times this and in other words d psi s is equal to c ox divided by this times d v g ok. Now, what I can do now is that this part right. First of all, if I can express this part as a measured low frequency capacitance, and then I can integrate this whole thing phi s psi s would be psi s 0 plus integration from v g naught to v g of c ox divided by c ox plus c s plus c i t d v g, right. I mean, I am just sort of integrating it. For example, at v g naught is equal to v f b, right your flat band voltage is 0 right. So, that is an initial condition for example ok and you know from that you can actually go to different gate voltages and you do this integration ok and you can get different values of psi s as a function of v g. What I am going to do now is that I am going to rewrite this right I based on you know this capacitance equation 1 over C L F is 1 over C ox plus 1 over C s plus C i t ok and I am multiplying this equation on both side by C ox again doing some algebraic manipulation here ok and I am simplifying that equation and what I get is C ox divided by C ox plus C s plus C i t is same as 1, 1 minus C l f by C ox now this is something interesting right. C l f is what is measured externally C ox can always be obtained because it is uh, you know looking at the accumulation value of capacitance you can find out what is C ox right. In other words this term inside the integral can be replaced by 1 minus C L f measured divided by C ox. So, now all you need to do is that put different values of psi s 
at these different values of psi s you precisely know you know what is the value of v g ok and accordingly you also know what is the value of c i t. So, at different values of v g you know what is the value of l f capacitance that you have measured and hence you would be able to find out d i t as a function of psi s again you are mapping d i t to psi s two major differences one first difference is that the way I computed d i t is from low frequency capacitance ok and this is what I used to compute d i t that is one major difference compared to previous technique in previous technique only high frequency was used. The second difference also is that to compute psi s versus v g relationship earlier I did it using high frequency curve, but now I am doing it with a low frequency curve. So, both these things are done using a low frequency capacitance voltage characteristic right that is a major departure here ok. And hence you know again this was first postulated by Bogland and this is use using an integration process to compute psi s versus v g relationship and hence the name d i t computation using the Bergelin's integration ok to get that psi s versus v g relationship. Okay. One last technique if you have both high and low frequency at your disposal ok then what you can do is that you can use what is called a h f l f technique right meaning that I have measured high frequency capacitance which looks like this, I have measured a low frequency capacitance which looks like this in this region which is where your band bending is going from flat band to inversion that is the region of interest for us ok from 0 to 2 phi b psi s is going from 0 to 2 phi b. In this region your low frequency capacitance is higher compared to high frequency capacitance you can look at this difference and you can get c i t as you know something like this you make use of a low frequency capacitance and the c s that I had in the previous equation that can be computed using high frequency capacitance 1 over c h f minus 1 over c ox inverse. So, the c i t or in other words d i t is now computed based on two actually measured values ok low frequency value and high frequency value right and this is how I get d i t as a function of v g at different values of v g I get d i t. But uh, you really need to map it to different values of surface potential and in order to get that you still need psi s versus v g. So, that you can if you get psi s versus v g then because you know this you can map this d i t versus psi s and for that you know <coughs> you can essentially use the same uh, Bergelin's uh, integration that we talked about earlier right. You can use that and you would be able to get psi s versus v g relationship from the low frequency curve. You do it from the low frequency rather than high frequency because the integration process will not give rise to too much of noise whenever you are trying to do differentiation from a measured curve you can end up with large noise in the differentiation process ok. And this is what is called a h f l f technique right. So, one can extract this interface trap density either solely by high frequency curve or solely by low frequency curve or a combined high and low frequency curve right. Uh, so, depending on what you have at your disposal you can do one or all of these. And this also happens to be one very important uh, you know parameter extraction process. So, then let us uh, you know stop here uh, uh, that sort of completes all the discussion on MOS capacitance characterization and uh, in the next lecture we will uh, you know discuss about uh, current voltage characterization on a, a transistor ok.